Welcome to Mulready Minutes with Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. This is a podcast about insurance for insurance folks, risk managers, and business leaders. We'll dive deep and look at what is and isn't working, talk to leaders in the industry, and keep you informed on what's happening in Oklahoma and around the country. Hello, all. Welcome to Mulready Minute podcast. I'm uh, Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready. Uh, today, we have a topic that is... Um, very important and uh, on the forefront of the NEIC agenda and what's happening, NEIC of course being the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and something that we've been working on for some time. Uh, The U.S. population is aging, everyone except me that is, uh, and the need for long-term care uh, services is on the rise. However, the number of folks offering long-term care insurance has changed dramatically, decreasing from uh, uh, almost 100 in 2004 to really about a dozen here in 2021. Uh, that's just one of the many challenges that are facing long-term care or the folks that are offering that coverage. And we are really pleased to have with us today uh, one of the leaders on the issue, definitely the leader on the issue at the NEIC, uh, and that is Virginia Insurance Commissioner Scott White. Scott uh, is a very well-respected member of the NEIC. Scott's background in the department and his agency is is on that financial side of things. He chairs the E-Committee for the NEIC. And uh, for today's uh, Uh, topic. He's also the chair of the NEIC working group that's focused on long-term care insurance. Uh, Commissioner White, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Glenn. It's good to be here. Good. Uh, We'll get right into it if you're you're ready on that, but uh, one of the biggest challenges for insurers and and us as state regulators uh, is that the policies were established when uh, pricing assumptions were too low to keep up with the demand of of baby boomers, longer life expectancies, uh, lapse rates, did not uh, reach the level that were expected. Uh, they're lower than initially assumed, uh, resulting in higher exposure for the companies, right? So um, these made it necessary for the insurers to increase rates to ensure solvency. And, and as Scott knows with his financial background, but every regulator, our main role is ensuring uh, the solvency of those companies. So when the time of claim comes, that company is there and they're fulfilling the obligations of that contract. Um, Scott, all those things I just threw out there, um, walk us through, if you would, um, how and why this happened and how, how did we get to where we are today? I'll be happy to. And, and Glenn, I think you did a very good job of really putting your finger on on how these uh, problems develop to where we are today. Uh, you know, you can start it back, I think, as far back as the 70s when this product was first developed. They didn't really have anything, any data to really estimate these claims. And we're talking about a claim that can happen 30 to 40 years in the future. We call these long tail. So it's very important, but also very difficult to make assumptions uh, so you can get those premiums to where they need to be. And so they were relying on disability policies that really weren't uh, useful in terms of predicting when long-term claims would happen. So you had that. And what ultimately developed is there, we always point to four different factors uh, that, that they got wrong. Number one, uh, they didn't know how many people would go on claim. Uh, they didn't know how, how long these folks would go on claim. Uh, they didn't know what the cost of these would be. And, and these lapses, I think you referenced, how many people would give up their policies? A lot more people are giving up policies on disability claims than they would uh, for long-term care. Another thing that doesn't get mentioned, but which is really important, is the low interest rate environment. It just, it's, been going, it's been on for 10, 15 years, and it's really impacted uh, the investments of these long-term carriers. So all of which is to say, and again, you mentioned this, Glenn, in the 1990s, we have a ton of policies being sold, right? I think... 700,000 is the number I've seen. These are people in their mid 50s. These people are buying very rich policies. The insurance companies are are going out and offering unlimited benefits, 5% compound inflation. And then they find out about 10, 15, 15 years later that they got it wrong in terms of the pricing, that there's a lot more claims coming in than they anticipated. And they, and again, these are very rich benefits. Uh, and so what they're looking at is we've got to increase our reserves, bolster those reserves. And when we do that, we need to go out and get uh, rate increases from the states. And that's really what happened. Uh, you know, we, we, ha- we had these significant rate increases, these rate shocks coming into all the states. Consumers are very upset, understandably. And, uh, you know, there's no real uh, easy answers to this, Glenn, when these premiums, uh, you can't have premiums not going up, benefits not going down. Uh, and no one pays extra when you have a situation where the carriers are really losing money on these these older blocks 
uh, that again they didn't price correctly. So uh, you know, there's a, there's a. I'll end with the point you made. We we as regulators, as commissioners, have a very strong desire to protect consumers from these types of high rate increases. On the other hand, financial solvency is the backbone mm -hmm. of state regulation. We want to make sure that these long term care companies are around in the future to pay claims. So it's this. Uh, these two competing policies are the crosshairs of one another, which is why the states have had such a difficult time getting their arms around this issue. Uh, I, I know part of the problem that's been happening is you have some states that are, I don't know, putting a stake in the sand and saying, we're not going to allow any rate increases. You have others that are granting whatever is required to uh, have the solvency of those companies, which could be triple digit rate increases potentially. Uh, and then you have others that are in between that have you know, formed some sort of compromise. Um, so there's no uniformity about the rate review process and, and, and approvals. Can you give us uh, an update on that? I know that your your uh, committee, your working group has been working on that. So uh, talk to us about that that rate review and uniformity issue. Absolutely. And 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 you put again, you, you said the right things in terms of should there be uniformity, should there be consistency? And I think the the the, the point I always make to the members is we think so. This is a product that's the same whether you buy it in Virginia. Or Oklahoma, we know the carriers use nationwide data because there's simply not enough data in a particular state to have a statistically credible data on which to base those rates. The other thing is, you know, reviewers in your state and mine, does it make sense for everyone to be reviewing the same product? A lot of states don't have the resources to do that. So this idea that, that began to emerge, uh, let's say about four or five years ago in one of these lower committees and work or lower working groups was Maybe we borrow an idea from the multi-state uh, market conduct examination uh, examinations that go on, and we could have a small team of actuaries uh, put them in place to conduct these reviews, use a, the same methodology. Uh, they would review a filing, and then they would make a recommendation to the states. We have to always emphasize that the states are ultimately going to make the decision on what their rates are in that state, but maybe this team can provide some guidance and 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 take away all the inefficiencies and lack of uh, fairness and, and consistency. So once this task force was formed in 2019, we really looked at that as that's going to be a key uh, deliverable for this to work. And we put together about five actuaries that had a lot of experience uh, in reviewing these rates. Uh, we asked them to do a pilot program where they've reviewed three different filings, including. Uh, a really challenging one from Genworth Insurance Company, and based on that, we've learned here's what we need to uh, here's what we need to put around them to make this successful. So we're talking about operations, processes, rules in place to make sure that the process runs smoothly, and also the methodology, the the way the actuaries uh, review and develop the rates so that it makes sense for long term care. And we've spent the last uh, year plus uh, working that we've we've developed what we call the framework and the framework again builds out the operations, gets that methodology in place. So where we are now, Glenn, is we are uh, getting feedback from stakeholders, the industry, consumer groups hope to finalize that within the next six months. If everything goes out, uh, goes as planned uh, and then once that's in place, which again, that might take longer to get that approved up through uh, the various. Uh, process at the NEIC, we hope to get the, uh, the the MSA team, we call it the multi-state actuarial team, actually doing those reviews, making those recommendations. But I always end with, uh, in order for this to work, we're going to need participation from the industry, but we're also going to need all the states. We have 45 states on this uh, task force to not only participate, but to hopefully rely on the recommendations of this team. That's great. And Scott, thank you for your leadership on that. Kudos to you and your leadership on that. Uh, and also uh, Commissioner Conway from um, Colorado, who also has been a, a leader on trying to, well, it's just tough to do. It's tough to navigate, uh, trying to bring some uniformity, yet maintaining uh, state regulation, state by state, uh, in charge of each state, bringing some efficiency and um, and uniformity to that. So tough to navigate, but kudos for your leadership there. Um, when we're talking about the problem, as, as we've been discussing here, uh, of course, you're talking about reserves, uh, capital reserves, and uh, big number type stuff. W what are we looking at? What's that total picture look like um, overall? Do you have an idea um, on that? Yeah, yes, I, I have in the past. I was I was getting ready for a presentation last week, so I did go back and look. In 2018, we got some numbers. Uh, 
And, and the numbers to, might not surprise you, Glenn, they're in the, the tens of billions, right? So what that means is, who knows, it's a very, it's a very large number. Uh, on the other hand, it's one that's going down, right? Um, we, we, we have, uh, the first thing I talk about with reserves is, when you look at the task force, we have three different things going on. We have this approach to have consistent rate reviews. Uh, we want to make sure consumers have options and they understand those options and hopefully we can get into that a little bit. We also want to focus on solvency. And so again, we have this small team of uh, actuaries that look at reserves and they're going in. They have a lot more data, a lot more knowledge now today than they did even five years ago. So we can go in and, and look at a Genworth or another company and make sure that they that their assumptions are in line, that they're using the approaches we expect of them to develop the reserves. And when the data comes back and it shows that they're missing those numbers, we're going to encourage them through the, the domestic state regulator to bolster those. And so in the last two, three years, I think tens of billions of dollars have is what we've seen in terms of the industry bolstering their reserves. But still, it's it's a it's it's a difficult situation because carriers are still uh, paying out more in claims, significantly more in claims than they are in taking in, in premiums. So it's a moving target. Uh, what we're saying is in this one area where we call morbidity, which is really describing how much, uh, how long somebody's gonna be on claim, we still don't have enough data there. And that's a big driver of premiums. And so the numbers that come in tend to be off in a direction that requires them to bolster their reserves. So as much as they're, they're, they're bolstering reserves, we're still going back and saying, look, you're not there, you need to increase those. And of course, that leads to these uh, rate increases that are going back to the states. So you have the state saying, well, you just filed a rate increase, you know, two years ago. Why are you coming back? Typically, it's because of adverse development. It's, it's the claims are coming back and they are worse than anticipated. So it's not it's not helpful to regulators. The consumers are upset and the long term care companies don't like it either. So, again, as we are emphasizing today, it's a challenging situation. Yeah, it is very challenging. Um, it, let me let me put something out there a little more, I guess, localized level. So you have a policyholder in Virginia or a policyholder in Oklahoma. They're receiving a, a, a rate increase that uh, is substantial. And, of course, substantial is a, a relative term, but double digits, whatever. Um, are there other options out there for folks or what, what kind of options are available for folks that maybe can't afford or don't believe at that moment they can afford that rate increase? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is this is such a great product in terms of its value. Remember, this, these these uh, carriers were offering unlimited benefits with, in many cases, 5 percent inflation, compound inflation uh, riders. And, and when they go to their advisor or they go to their agent, they say, listen, you'd be crazy to give up this. Uh, but it gets to a point when uh, the carriers keep coming back to, to with the need to increase those, whatever the states does in terms of approval, where we are seeing more consumers uh, understanding in many cases, Glenn, that they have more coverage than they're ever going to need. That's mm -hmm. going to be uh, a decision each person has to make, each family has to make. But if they decide that, what we don't want is them to just give up the policy, right? That's that Nobody wants that. And we also don't want them, in many cases, to... There's an option called paid up benefits, where they just get the premium back. Again, fifty thousand dollars in premium they paid over ten years is not going to be a, a solution to, uh, you know, the medical bills they might be facing down the road if there is an event that requires that. So, a lot of different options out there. We call these reduced benefit options, and uh, and in many cases uh, they they are uh, appropriate for what a consumer might need. What we do as regulators, Glenn, is we make sure that if you're reducing those benefits and making that an option for the consumer, we want that to have actuarial value, which is one way of saying it. We want it to be reasonable. So we want to, uh, we either want you to maintain that level premium or reduce it even, but we want the benefits that are being reduced because of that to kind of have a relationship there. And, and so we have a lot of discussions with the carriers to make sure that they're doing that appropriately. Uh, you're seeing some carriers come in and saying, look, uh, New York Life is doing this. They're saying, look, we we're, we have a pretty significant rate increase, but if you accept this, we promise in the contract that we'll never uh, raise your rates again. So I know they've mm -hmm. gone out to different states and offered that option, and I think it's been uh, pretty well received. So again, that's part of the task force where we've adopted uh, guiding principles to make sure that carriers are, are, are providing fair and reasonable options and making sure that those options are, are reasonable. 
Good. And, and Scott, uh, you, you alluded to it, and it was something that as I started digging into this issue uh, surprised me, but uh, you, you made that point, and that is as substantial and significant as some of these rate increases have been, um, it, it's a very small percentage of folks that are allowing those to lapse, which tells us that the average person with a long-term care policy strongly values that product and, and the benefit that that brings to them. I know this year the task force appointed a subgroup to review and update the uh, our long-term care, the NAIC, Long-Term Care Insurance Model Act. Uh, what what do you hope this group accomplishes? Sort of where, where are they heading with that? Yeah, so it just makes sense. Again, there's a lot of moving pieces with the task force. This is one over on the side that is looking at what is the task force going to do? And wh when we find out what that is, when the dust settles, they may, may need to make certain changes to this these models, right? So there have been a couple changes to the models in terms of the pricing requirements. And again, this methodology that we're developing, those changes, if they get finalized, may need may require changes to our model. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the market has evolved, right? There are a lot of different options that are being uh, that are available that weren't 10 years ago as carriers try to react to uh, the, the, the challenges to the long term care market. And as always, as you know, there are always technical changes that the regulators like to go in there and get their red pencils out. So there's a combination of that. But what I might close with, Glenn, is 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 asking what what uh, would what would make this task force successful? Uh, what does success look like in terms of uh, the market, maybe in five years? And when it comes to new products, which again, this is what this regulation will be focused on, we want them to be better priced, right? And we want to make sure the benefits line up with the premiums. Maybe mm -hmm. don't offer such rich benefits if you can't afford those. Uh, but in terms of, uh, and, and if we do that, I think we're going to be able to lure carriers back into the market. You mentioned how much the market has 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 gone from 100 some carriers uh, five years or 10 years ago to less than a dozen today. So we would have a healthier market uh, with uh, affordable coverage that has you know good benefits that are realistic. In terms of the older blocks where we have these huge rate increases, we want to manage those. Uh, the way we have recently, we want to keep an eye on those reserves, make sure they'll be around to pay claims. Uh, we want to give uh, consumers options if they can't afford those, and we want to make sure they can understand the options that are being provided by the insurance carrier. As you, I'll close with, uh, we want we want there to be a private market solution uh, to the to aging population. Right, we have a role to play. There are 13 million uh, Americans out here that need this and could use this coverage, that's going to increase to about 30 million in the coming years. So again, we're never going to take over this market, but we want to play a role, kind of like with private flood. You have the uh, federal program, but private private flood insurance plays a role and long-term care private market should play a role as well. And state regulators need to do our part to make sure that that, that, that is available. That's a great wrap up. Thank, thank you, Scott. Um, and I'll just say this, folks, uh, we've been really blessed and pleased to have, have Scott here with us. You can now see, after this brief discussion on, on a very challenging issue, arguably the most challenging issue the NEIC has faced in a while, but why I have such great confidence uh, to have someone like Scott leading that charge as he just dissected with us uh, the issue and, and, and what we're facing with that. So uh, with that, we're going to close out. Scott, Commissioner White, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. It's been a pleasure, Glenn. Uh, that'll wrap up this episode. We look forward to uh, seeing you next time. If you found this episode informative, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Visit oid.ok.gov slash podcast. Let us know what topics you would like to hear about on this podcast. Until next time, take care from the Oklahoma Insurance Department.